Some flies get drunk until they fall in and other bugs think that they found an oasis and uh, end up getting stuck forever. But there is this plant which traps its bugs by snapping shut after sensing them. This behavior really does seem actually smart or intelligent or, or conscious, like as a plant, like more conscious than like a Caesar salad. As you can probably imagine in the Bay Area, I'm surrounded by plant-based meat. Here in my yard though, we have a few meat-based plants. The pitcher plant, sorry, he was demanding my attention. Um, I'm sure he'll want to go down in a second. But, um, so, <laughs> and with what's currently happening with this AI revolution, it got me thinking, are these plants somehow in some way intelligent? There's this video that I found on YouTube that you can check out in the description where um, they connect a Venus flytrap, as a matter of fact, to another plant. Um, and they're able to get the electrical impulses from the flytrap uh, to cause a reaction in another plant. So in this way, it does seem like there's at least something that's called physical intelligence. So imagining these electrical impulses that the Venus flytrap produces, which can be, which can control another plant physically, uh, it got me thinking about robotics. And we're going to look at some plant-based robotics in a little bit, um, which is a field that I'm calling robotany, which doesn't seem to be a very common term, but I can't say that I necessarily invented it. So this admittedly kind of bizarre train of thought just got me wondering if in some way this plant, the Venus flytrap, kind of passed the Turing test. You see, back in 1950, people were kind of dumb. So they thought their computers were powerful enough to be intelligent. However, the year is now 2023 and people are also dumb. So we sort of just think the same thing. The Turing test is a way to gauge if a machine is intelligent, um, but see, during each decade, our standards for what is intelligent shift. Uh, it's from more simple, question answering was the original Turing test, um, to now more complex definitions. So let's take ChatGPT as an example. Getting it to answer a bunch of smart questions correctly doesn't make me or most people, I think, think of it as intelligent. When I asked it to draw a bat ray using the process encoding language, it made this blob with eyes. And okay, so I asked it, how, how did it even know or understand what a bat ray looks like if it was only trained off of text? And it explained to me that enough of its training data sort of described, people wrote about what a bat ray looks like so it could piece it together and sort of infer. Now, this is one of those behaviors where even though, yes, the drawing is terrible, it's actually so impressive to be able to convert text into an image at all. An even better example of this is a video that coincided with the Microsoft Sparks of AGI paper, and that video is linked in the description. I do think that in the 1950s, this whole AI revolution would have caused some serious panic, but today, okay, so actually, yes, it caused panic today as well. So let's just get back to plants for now. Um, it's not totally fair to compare the Venus flytrap to ChatGPT because the machine learning model to mimic a Venus flytrap wouldn't necessarily be gener generative, meaning um, it wouldn't generate chats or images or anything like that. Neither the Venus flytrap nor the AI like understand in the way that we do. But I do like to think of the Venus flytrap and evolution in general um, kind of like a giant data set, the, the largest data set possible that we've all and all creatures and plants and everything have been trained on um, to adapt and evolve and our genetic encoding. Considering the Venus flytrap again, it's kind of like a form of learning, um, not in the conscious cognitive sense we often associate with animals, but a form of implicit learning that has been like etched into their physicality. Even though it sounds so different, it's really similar to how we can consider traditional intelligence. Your brain, as it learns, is creating physical electrical pathways that make physical connections. There's some technology that could trace the map of your connections and potentially even determine which pathways should be, <laughs> I don't know, like sealed up with what I'm just gonna call 
unlearning goo. As it turns out, I am not the first person to bring up this connection. So while researching the insights into this video, I stumbled upon a paper by Peter Nick, and that's also linked in the description. The paper is called Intelligence Without Neurons, a Turing Test for Plants. It has a question mark at the end. Here is an unjustifiably short rundown of the paper. It says, all living organisms are endowed with the ability to perceive and respond to signals from the environment. But electric phenomenon in plants don't match animal neural counterparts. It may be helpful to take a little detour looking at seemingly different but related phenomenon of so-called artificial intelligence. This technological advance is progressively entering our everyday experience and inspires both awe and fascination because it is somehow behaving like us, but on the other side remains deep alien to us. Rather than recycling the same arguments again and again, it would be worth developing nonverbal Turing tests. In other words, we need a Turing test for plants. But it's not just learning facts or memorization that is physical. Habits are also physical. Check out the book, Habits of a Happy Brain. Um, it's linked in the description, and I was lucky enough to be part of video content for it. Now, unlike plants, we have to learn just about everything. We don't have a lot of survival instincts, um, at least not the ones that are super relevant today. But plants with no brain are all instincts from root to leaf and that instinct is spread across their entire body. I would say like we as people, even though we are born stupid, we take learning to new heights, introducing reasoning into what we learn. And perhaps our true quest isn't artificial intelligence, but a more nuanced form of artificial reasoning. That does seem to be what most people find so impressive about ChatGPT 4 versus 3.5. So if my flytrap possesses physical intelligence and runs pretty much mechanically, then is it less like an AI and, and more like a robot? So zoobotics is the practice of creating animal-inspired robots that move or behave like animals, uh, but robotony is the practice of creating robots that behave like plants. Case in point, the work by Speck, Chang, Klim, et al. in their paper, Plants as Inspiration for Material-Based Sensing and Actuation in Soft Robotics and Machines. I guess I really connect with it because I always thought of plants as being very stationary until I got the Venus flytrap. And you'll see in a sec how it really pushes the envelope on ways that robots can react and sense in their environment. By the way, soft robotics basically means that it's a robot that uses um, usually flexible materials, things that mimic um, or help it to behave like a natural soft-bodied creature, animal or plant. Considering artificial intelligence and robotics and other ways that we help our experience in the world be augmented, whether it's screen readers or robotic limbs, and I mean, even, even more simple things like text messaging. I really do think that anything and everything we do that moves us forward as a species is a natural event of evolution. Um, and it's easy to think that there is a humanity and nature, but as Rita Sharma from the GTU puts it, there is only nature and we are part of it. That doesn't mean that it's always good. Remember, evolution is like random mutations and only a few of them really stick. But that really is kind of what human ingenuity and invention is. It's random acts of production. Whether they help us or, or destroy us, there is no denying that they still came from us. But there is wisdom to gather from the so-called natural world. In my interview with Pi on this channel, which is linked below, I talked to it about how war doesn't just date back to the beginning of our species single-celled organisms from the very, very beginning had to also compete for resources and space. So unfortunately, violence does seem to be innate that, um, you know, even the billions of cells or however many it is that make up our physical bodies today are capable of war. Obviously, we should strive for peace because luckily we can think in ways that a single cell cannot, but it is, it is something to reflect on. Mimicking biology doesn't have to always mean violence and competition. A lot of us have thought about before how small roads are kind of like 
capillary veins and uh, the high waists are like arteries. So it's very common to create things that are mimicked off of nature that eventually stop feeling like they're part of the natural world. That was quite the tangent, but the paper that I mentioned earlier, the one that demonstrates robotics and biomimetics in several ways, has a few super cool examples. And we're gonna start with this one, the pine cone. You can see that this image demonstrates the change that the pine cone goes through uh, from zero minutes to 20 minutes, all the way up to 160 minutes as it dries out. As the pine cone dries, it slowly opens up, which is an adaptation over time. And that's gonna be important in a second. And you can see each part of the pine cone has its own job. They have special layers and, and, and a key bendy part controls the movement. In figure B, they call it the bending zone and it is located uh, close to the base. So with that inspiration from the pine cone, you can see a concept for a roof that contracts and expands to help encourage rainwater running off as it's wet and then reflecting sunlight off of the same roof when the top of the building either detects light or dries up physically, essentially making a roof based off of the pine cone. I think this one here is my favorite. It introduces this concept of 4D printing. It comes from a study titled Bio-Inspired Motion Mechanisms, Computational Design, and Material Programming of Self-Adjusting 4D Printed Wearable Systems. I'm familiar with 3D printing. I actually, I have a 3D printer, but I had never thought about incorporating a fourth dimension into objects. The fourth dimension, of course, being time. And you can see here in this image that the researchers 3D printed a splint that um, had specific tension points, which would shift over time. So it basically dynamically adapts to the healing process of an injured arm. The tension and the shape, they change over time, which kind of eliminates potentially the need for multiple casts or you know manual adjustments. And now we can bring it on back to the little plant that got me spiraling down this um, proverbial K-hole. The device that they built, the AVF, artificial venous flytrap, has a few different methods to close. So uh, there's air pressure based on heat, magnets, um, or like a mixture of warmth and moisture. What I, where I'm imagining this sort of technology actually being applied, you are taking a shower and it gets really steamy and you forgot to open up the window, then potentially there could be a sensor and this type of mechanism that would open the window for you just based on that. And then if you forget to close the window, maybe even more important, as that steam and moisture disappear, the window would close itself. It's like a whole new way to think about a smart home. So instead of technology that like steals your personal data and makes you pay monthly subscriptions, it's just like a mechanical thing that's based on a Venus flytrap that helps you keep your house safer. Like that's amazing. So what can we take away from all of these ideas and this research that is sort of going unnoticed? I think what it does is reinforce an argument that I had never really given much thought to, but is fairly common, which is that we, in terms of artificial intelligence, we need to stop applying this human-centered approach to mimicking our own intelligence and figure out ways that we can also imprint other life forms intelligence into our own machines. Robots, software, automated features, physical intelligence. Imagine having a mouse on your computer that can sense if you're squeezing it a little tighter than usual and can recommend a playlist for you to start listening to that might help you calm down. Or another idea, and I do think something like this already exists in some capacity, but blinds in your window that will strategically close or open based on the position of the sun. So don't forget to keep evolving and utilizing the world around you, not just the one inside of you. When I released my video interviewing Pi, so many of you commented ideas, questions, also insults uh, that I thought were really introspective and, and really valid in a lot of ways. So let me know what you think about all of this research. Is it total bullshit? Are you imagining ways that you can incorporate it into what you do? Or have I completely lost my mind and just wasted your time? <laughs>